Hey guys, welcome to our, uh, our video series here on the CCIE version 5 lab exam. I, I just finished teaching a boot camp last week and, and the class and I spent a lot of time talking about the lab. Uh, not in detail the lab, right? I mean, not giving away answers. We don't do that. But, but we were talking a lot about the testing center. Um, how do you find the testing center? I mean, we, we talked about everything. Um, what does the lab exam, you know, kind of look like? What, what are the menus like? You know, does the desktop stay up the whole time? And just, I mean, there were so many questions that I got that I actually decided to go and post something on our Facebook page. And I asked the 6,000 folks on, um, on our RNS study group page and, and uh, I asked if, if this video series would help and everybody unanimously, unanimously said yes. And so here we are, I'm recording this video. This is gonna be a four part video series on the CCIE version five lab exam. Everything from the parking lot and the testing center to when you walk out of the lab. I'm gonna to hope to cover in the next four videos. Now, this video here is going to be a generalization of the lab exam. So, the testing center, what should you bring with you? Um, some of the major changes between V4 and V5. Uh, the desktop you're gonna be running on, the environment, things like that. And the next three videos will be focused on the three individual sections that you're going to deal with in your lab, which are troubleshooting, diagnostics, and configuration. So without further ado, let's take a quick dive into this small PowerPoint presentation of half a dozen bullet points, and let's go over some of the things that you really should be prepared for in your lab. So one of the biggest changes between V4 and V5 is the fact that you are now 100% virtualized, okay? So Cisco has taken its virtualized platform and they've configured, they've built for you a virtualized rack of equipment and that is what you're going to take your lab on. So everything throughout the duration of your lab, from the time you sit down and you say begin exam and you're in troubleshooting all the way down until the time the proctor walks in at the end of the day, and says write your configurations and you're in the configuration section, every single device you touch through that eight hour span of time is gonna be a virtualized piece of gear, okay? Not one configurable device that you touch through the duration of your lab is going to be physical, all right? Now, big change between V4 and V5 because in V4, we had four routers and six, no, four switches and six routers. I always do that. So we had four switches, six routers, where as now it's, it's all virtual and the size of the topology has changed. So you went from four routers, four switches and six routers to anywhere from 20 to 30 routers and eight to 10 switches. Now, obviously that, that uh, the amount of hardware you're going to get is gonna be based on what revision of the exam you get within the V5 blueprint, but you need to be prepared to see this size of devices. So this here is just a huge change between V4 and V5 because again, you had four 3560s, you had six, I think there were 2600s or 2800s, I don't remember which. They were all running 12.x code, which now we're gonna be running 15.x iOS, whichever platform we're on. So obviously for the switches, we're gonna be running a layer two image and for routers, we're gonna be running a layer three image, right? Um, so this is just a huge change because you've gone from this very small condensed physical topology to this massive virtual topology. But this actually is a great benefit to you. And let me explain why. There was a lot of folks back in V4 that would say they failed because the proctor went and unplugged the cable, which was of course not true. So because the proctors aren't there to make you fail, the proctors are there to actually make sure that you don't cheat and to make sure that you do a good job in your lab exam. I know sometimes they can be cold hearted. I know sometimes they, they come off as somebody you don't really want to talk to and befriend, but believe me, I know, I know some of the proctors pretty well and believe me, they are very, very nice people. They're just there to do their job. So they're not there to make you fail. Okay. Trust me, take my word for it. Okay. There's no more real physical problems that you can have. I mean, yeah, you can have a link fail inside the data center. You can have uh, the, maybe the physical server that you're running on go down. And of course your virtual rack would go down, but Cisco's built in a number of redundancies to accommodate for that type of failure. So yeah, you might be down for 15 or 20 minutes if, if, if a server crashes or something goes down in the data center, but you're gonna get that time back. Nobody's gonna go in and delete a virtual connection between the two virtualized devices when you can't get to that virtualized platform to put them back. Now, there have been some folks that say, yeah, I failed my exam because there was actually a, a virtualization bug in my lab. Now, I'm not gonna say that doesn't happen. I'm gonna say the, the odds of that happening are pretty slim. If that does happen, you need to prove to the proctor that it is in fact a bug or it is in fact something that is outside of your control. Okay, you will have to actually prove to the proctor that the error messages that you're getting are not iOS messages, that they're actually based on whatever virtualized platform Cisco's running, all right? But again, 
Most of the folks that I talk to have never had a physical or virtualized problem with their rack. It's all, it's all been based on they just didn't configure it properly, which is okay. Let's face it. If you don't do it right, you're not an IE. You go back, you study more. You go back, you become an IE. That's how it works. So <clears throat> that's one piece where it benefits you because there's no more questions that somebody's unplugging a cable on you. The second thing and the second area where it really helps you is think about those of you guys that studied for the V4. Think about what you had to do. I mean, you had this very small condensed topology that you had to configure almost everything. You had like every routing protocol, you had all, I mean, I studied for the V4. You had everything packed into this small condensed topology. Well, in the V5, they've made it a lot more realistic. Now think about this for a second, 20 to 30 routers. For some of us, that's like one floor of some of our infrastructures, right? I mean, eight to 10 switches, that's like one small office. You know what I mean? That's, that's nothing compared to what we may see on a daily basis in our real infrastructures. I mean, some of us are dealing with hundreds, thousands of different devices. This topology is really not that big when you think about it. It is a little bit bigger to do in a, you know, eight hour span of time, but believe me, Cisco's gonna make it doable because people are passing, right? Now, we move from having to put all of this technology in this small condensed topology to actually being able to spread it out more. So Cisco again has made this topology a lot more realistic where we might have multiple offices, we might have multiple campuses, we could have multiple geographical locations, we could have multiple floors within a building. So they've actually made this a lot more realistic where yes, we have a lot more devices, but they're also spread out a lot more to make it more realistic in what you're going to see in your daily in your daily job, in your daily duties as a consultant or a full-time network engineer, okay? Some of these offices are gonna connect using layer three VPN. Maybe this office over here is gonna run some VRFs and this office down here is gonna connect to a GRE tunnel or some type of DMVPN or whatever it may be, IPsec, who knows? But regardless, Cisco's built in all this technology to actually make a full-blown real live topology of what our network may actually look like based on this scale of devices. So when you think about it, 20 to 30 routers and eight to 10 switches is really like a small mid-sized company that you as a CCIE are being called in to fix and you are being called in to configure and make, make it work, make it happy, all right? So now let's talk about the testing center for a little bit. What I would recommend that you guys do, now I'm, I'm here in the United States, so I can only talk about San Diego, California, and Raleigh, North Carolina, right? I don't know the other testing centers around the world. I do get a lot of questions about the mobile lab. I hear it's pretty good. Um, depending on where you are, I hear that the mobile lab is actually pretty good right now. I, I hear some mixed reviews, but for the most part, I hear that it's pretty good. The connection is pretty fast and stable. Um, you know, it, It's a little bit cramped because you're in a bus, but for the most part, it works pretty well. So the mobile lab may be something that you think about. I didn't take it, so I'm not gonna really talk about it because I can't tell you for a fact. I did take my lab uh, in both San Diego and um, North Carolina, so I'm gonna talk about both. When you get to the testing center, you wanna get there, you wanna leave yourself enough time. First of all, get a good night's sleep the night before. A lot of my students say, yeah, I really couldn't sleep and you're gonna be really nervous. So just try to get a good night's sleep, all right? So you're gonna get a good night's sleep. You probably won't, because I know I didn't. And um, you know, you're gonna go to sleep one, two o'clock in the morning and be exhausted. It is what it is. So try to get a good night's sleep. Leave early enough to leave, to, to, to leave yourself that oops, there's traffic or oh no, there's a car accident or something along those lines because the proctors are not always um, very giving when it comes to time. If you show up a half hour late, assuming somebody didn't die, and, and I don't mean to get, you know, uh, I don't mean to go over the line with that, but, but honestly, assuming something catastrophic didn't happen, the proctors aren't going to be real giving in giving you that half hour of your time back. You're most likely going to lose it. So you want to leave yourself enough time to get to the lab with enough time to, to spare. I, I generally like to leave myself about a half hour. When you get to the parking lot of the testing center, make yourself some cheat sheets a couple of weeks before, and those cheat sheets should contain maybe things like timers. Maybe you forget what the spanning tree timers are off the top of your head, or, or BGP timers, or just, you know, make yourself up a cheat sheet of the things that you just need to remember, and you plan on just writing down the minute you sit down in your testing, at, at, your, at your workstation. So, Get to the testing center, just do a quick review in your car, and then about five to 10 minutes before you actually have to um, go to the lobby or when you see folks starting to crowd around the lobby or, or, or outside in the front, that's when you wanna go and you wanna stand in the testing center because I'm telling you, 90% of the time, most of the folks that are kind of gathering in front of the building where, where the test is given, greater percentage of those folks are gonna be CCIE candidates that are there for their exam of whichever track. Now, sometimes the testing center is gonna be locked, 
because maybe you're there on a weekend. Maybe, you know, in, in North Carolina, it starts, I think, like 7 or 7.30. There's not always a receptionist that's there. Sometimes there is. And so the door may be locked. That's okay. You just kind of wait outside. When the proctor gets there, the proctor will come out and get you. Now, I want you to make sure that you listen very carefully to this statement. Anything that is not critical for you to survive or take your lab exam, you had better leave in your car. That is the best option for you. And I'll explain why in a couple minutes when I get there. The only thing that you should be bringing into the testing center is your body, meaning yourself, your clothes, because you need them, and a picture ID of some kind. License, passport, or military ID, those of you that are here in the United States, right? We give military IDs with your, your uh, photo on it and your signature. So you should bring one of those three pieces of identification with you. Reason is because the proctor is going to want to make sure that you are who you say you are and that your signature matches. So that should be the only three things you bring into the lab. Your clothes, your body, and a picture ID. That's it. Everything else should stay in your car, okay? Once the proctor comes out and greets you and explains to you all the rules that I'm going to basically go over with you anyway, but make sure you pay attention to the proctor when, when they tell you this because they're going to be very, very specific in what they want you to do. And if you don't follow your orders, the proctor is going to get upset with you, okay? So you're going to go up. You're going to, he's, he or she's going to call your name. You're going to go up. You're going to show them your ID. You're going to sign where they tell you to sign. They're going to give you a name tag. You're going to put it on your shirt and that's it. Once everybody that's there for their exam has that process completed, the proctor will walk everybody down through the, the Cisco building, you know, down through the hallways and kind of show you around. The bathrooms are there, the vending machines are there, coffee machines over there, blah, 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 blah. Then you will get to the testing center door. Now, behind that door is essentially where you're going to take your exam. Now, let me explain both locations. In San Diego, there's only one big room, okay? So all of the testing stations are in one row. They're basically half cubicles where when you sit down, you get a half height cubicle wall that you, you can't see over. You can't see the person next to you other than basically the top of their head, okay? That cubicle wall blocks the, obviously, from you seeing the screen to the person next to you. Now, they're not going to put two routing and switching people next to each other. If there's going to be two routing and switching folks, odds are you're going to be at two opposite ends of that row with data center guys or service provider guys or, you know, different tracks within you. You, you know what I'm saying? So they're not going to put you guys very close together. They're, they're going to do every other or something along those lines. So when you sit down in the testing center, when you get into the testing center, again, all these workstations are going to be in one single row. The proctor will sit in the very back corner, the left-hand back corner of the testing center, okay? Now, the collaboration guys are the only guys that are separate from this, and you don't care about the collaboration guys because you're watching this routing and switching video, but regardless, the collaboration guys are going to sit behind you with their backs to you, so they're actually going to sit behind you facing the wall. Now, I would recommend here that you bring earplugs if you're going to go to San Diego. Because it's inevitable that you're going to be two hours into your lab and all of a sudden you're going to start to hear all these random ringtones because the collaboration guy is playing with the ringtones and you're going to want to throw a phone across the room because it's going to break your concentration. And there's nothing worse than hearing random ringtones when you're really frustrated that you can't get something in BGP working properly or filtering working or whatever. There's nothing more frustrating, believe me. So bring earplugs. They will not give you earplugs in San Diego. They will, however, provide them for you in North Carolina. The proctor will actually give you a bin of fresh earplugs. Uh, the proctor there will stock them daily or whenever they run out. They're brand new. It's like a candy machine. You go up and you, you turn the crank. There's no money, no nothing. You just turn the crank, earplugs come out, and you're happy hunky-dory. Now, in North Carolina, this is a little bit different. When you walk through that door to the testing center, you're actually walking into the proctor's office, which is actually a small old data center, okay? That is where the proctor sits. The proctor sits facing a glass wall, okay? On the other side of that glass wall is where you are going to sit. Now, I think there's five rows in Raleigh, and each row you face the back of the person in front of you, but you can't see it because there's obviously a cubicle wall that covers uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're all around you, so the, really you can only see the top of everybody's head. You can't see everybody's workstation. Now, in both locations, there's going to be a set of lockers. In San Diego, the lockers are going to be directly in front of you where you're sitting. In North Carolina, the lockers are going to be in the first room in the proctor's office directly next to the proctor. What are those lockers for? They're basically bus lockers. They don't get locked. They don't get, there's no key. Right? They're basically bus lockers for you to bring all the personal items that you brought with you because you ignored my advice. 
Here's where I said I would get to why I recommend you leave everything in your car. And I'm going to use a cell phone as the best example. You are going to be very nervous on lab day. In fact, if somebody asks you your name, you're probably not going to be able to answer or you're going to have to think about it for a few minutes because you're honestly not going to know. Somebody's going to say, what's your name? And you're going to say BGP because that's what's going to be on your mind. And that's okay. But you're going to be really nervous. And a lot of times you may not hear all the requirements or the requests of the proctor. And this is why I say leave everything in your car. The proctor is going to tell you to make sure that all electronic devices are turned off and put into the locker. And it is inevitable that somebody is going to forget to turn off their cell phone. They're just going to put it on vibrate because they're not going to want to turn it off and they're going to put it in the locker. The minute one of those cell phone rings or a, or a watch timer goes off or an alarm goes off or there's a beep, a beep. It doesn't matter. Any, the minute one of those proctors in either location hears a beep or some sound from an electronic device in those lockers, they're going to ask every single candidate to get up, open their locker, and validate that every single electronic device is powered off. And if that takes 10 minutes for everybody to do, then everybody in the testing center is going to lose 10 minutes out of their lab the proctor will not give it back to you because it is essentially one of your faults that everybody has gotten up and, and had to go through this process. So do the safe thing, just bring your ID with you, your clothes and your body, and that's it. Both locations are gonna give you paper, I'll get to that. Both locations are gonna give you writing utensils, pencils and, and pens, so you don't need anything other than your clothes, your body and your ID, all right? Now, once you put all of your stuff in that locker, you're going to close it. The proctor is going to give you the times, what, what time you're going to start, what time you're going to take lunch. The proctor will give all of that to you. It's never the same thing because sometimes labs start a little bit later because maybe they have a problem with a security rack or a wireless rack or, you know, problems happen. So your, your lab isn't always going to start at exactly 7.30. Maybe it starts at 7.45 or 8 o'clock, okay? Now, regardless what location you're in, the proctor will tell you to go down the row and find your name. Again, in San Diego, everybody goes down the same row. In North Carolina, the proctor will tell you if you're taking routing and switching, go down this row. If you're taking wireless, go down this row. Or, you know, they'll say wireless and routing and switching are these two rows or something along those lines. Because again, they're generally not going to put two RNS guys and two wireless guys together. When you, when you find that piece of paper, that piece of paper is going to be sitting over the keyboard and it's going to have your name on it, an ID and a password. That ID and password are to get into the exam itself, not into the desktop. The desktop is going to automatically log in for you. It's automatically going to be logged in when you sit down, as a matter of fact. It doesn't matter who logs in, it matters who logs into the exam. Speaking about the desktop. The desktop itself is going to be a single desktop, a single machine, single keyboard, single mouse. These are going to be the cheapest $9 Walmart keyboards and mice that you can possibly find. They are going to be USB cabled. Let me stop there for a second. It is Cisco's policy to allow you to bring your own keyboard and mouse. There are some requirements or restrictions around that. They cannot be wireless. They cannot be... Um, they cannot be digitized in any way, meaning you can't have the scroll buttons like those nice fancy Logitech mouses or, you know, your, your, the keyboard that you bring can't have volume control in it or anything digital. It has to be just a plain bare bones keyboard and, and mouse and they cannot be wireless. I would recommend for you guys to use the ones that are there that Cisco provides you, even though they're cheap and even though they're pretty terrible compared to some of the nice stuff that we have, you know, in our homes and in our offices. Don't change it out unless you have a medical reason to. For example, if you have carpal tunnel and you need an ergonomic keyboard, then try to find you know the, the cheapest non-digital ergonomic keyboard that you can find and use that. But I would still keep the mouse, um, you know, keep the mouse the same, assuming you don't need to. If you have a medical reason, then you have to do what you have to do. The reason I say that is because if for some reason the machine starts to have physical problems because you've unplugged the keyboard and mouse, like, you know, maybe there's a new driver that needs to be installed, or maybe when you unplug it, you accidentally broke the USB port. I, you know, I don't know, I'm making stuff up, but the point is, is that the proctor will not help you troubleshoot that. So if you unplug the keyboard or mouse and you plug in your own and it doesn't detect it for whatever reason, and then you unplug your own and you plug back in the keyboard and mouse that, you, that, that came with the machine and it doesn't detect it either, that's your, your, your $1,600 lab day is gonna be spent troubleshooting a keyboard and mouse. The proctor will not help you. Okay, so if you don't need it, don't bother touching it. 
Now, the, 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 the machine itself, again, single desktop, single keyboard, single mouse, you are going to have dual screens here in the United States. So in both San Diego and uh, North Carolina, California and North Carolina, I should say, we have installed dual screens throughout all the testing centers. And I think they're 24 inch, I'm not exactly sure on the size, but they're pretty good size screens. They're not gonna be small. They're gonna be pretty good size. And they're mounted on swing arms. And so you can move them around. You just, the prompter's not gonna want you to go crazy with it, but you can move them around a little bit, you know, so that you can essentially see and maybe work a little bit better. The operating systems on these devices are going to be either XP or Windows 7. Now, when I took my lab, it was Windows XP. I do understand that they have upgraded some of these machines with the implementation of the dual screens, so you may have Windows 7. I'm not positive on that at this moment. The one thing that I want you to be aware of is that when I took my lab, I had one gig of memory, from what I recall. Maybe a little bit more than that, but it was around one or two gigs of memory. It was not fast at all. This machine is going to be something that is bare bones. In other words, it's the cheapest Walmart PC that they can buy. And they do that for a couple reasons. They do that because why spend a lot of money on CCIE candidates that are coming there to take their lap? Why, why give you guys the fastest, latest, and greatest machines? <clears throat> You're there to take a test. The second reason I believe that they do this is because they're simulating you walking into an environment with a network of that size and it's completely destroyed. Let's take the troubleshooting for example. It's completely destroyed, you need to fix it, you don't have your laptop, you don't have any of your equipment, and this is the best machine that the company can spare at the moment for you to use. Can you still fix their network? And to be honest with you, yes, you can. You should be able to because it's possible. I passed, you know, there's a ton of people that are passing, <clears throat> you can do it. So the machine is not gonna cause you to fail. However, if you're not prepared to work on a machine like that, then it may be, then it may cause you some heartache, okay? Now, the other thing that I want to mention here is that the Telnet client that you're going to get is going to basically be the Windows command prompt, okay? Now, when I took my lab, I didn't actually look at what it was that I was actually running, but it's very, very similar to the Windows command prompt. I've looked at it afterwards. It's not really putty. It's, it's definitely not secure CRT. It's not super putty. It's nothing of that kind. It is basically, if you open up your command prompt and your Windows machine, start, run, CMD, and hit enter, that is the exact same style and look and feel to what you are going to get in your routing and switching lab exam. <clears throat> When, for example, and, and let me explain why I say that, because most of us are used to a Telnet client where you can first of all have tabs, you can't have tabs. If you have 30 devices that you need to Telnet into, you are gonna have 30 individual Telnet sessions open at the same time. There's no tabs. The second big thing is that most of us are used to highlighting and when we right click it automatically pastes. Well, in the lab exam it doesn't do that. When you highlight something, it does copy, at least I think it copies, I remember it copying a little bit foggy, but when you right click, you have to actually select paste. I'll give you a funny thing that I did. I had, I had gone through a switch and I had built my template and I had gone through and, and did everything that I need to do and I did you know, my show history and I grabbed that chunk and I highlighted it and then I just very quickly went to the other switches that needed that config and I just right clicked and I wasn't paying attention and I ended up not pasting anything at all. And I took three or four minutes trying to figure out why nothing was working, and it was because I didn't actually paste the config. And then I went in and accidentally pasted the wrong config to the other switches that I needed because it was just, it just threw me off because I was so used to highlighting right click and I was so used to being, and I was very proficient at that in putty. The command client that you're gonna get in your lab is gonna be different, it is not putty as we're used to, okay? Again, it's gonna be very similar to the Windows command prompt, all right? Again, this machine is not gonna be very fast, it's gonna be pretty slow, so you're gonna to wanna to, to to watch what you keep open and what you don't keep open. Now, when we get to the other three videos that show the topology size, I'm gonna kinda of show you what I did to go through, you know, having to manage all these windows and whatnot, so I'm, I'm not gonna do that now, I'll do that later on, but just be careful about how much stuff you keep open. Even though you're gonna have dual screens, it's still gonna be a lot of windows open. You're gonna have a lot of real estate on these monitors and it, it is still gonna be a, a pretty big challenge. Now, when you sit down, you're gonna log into the exam. On the desktop, you're gonna have two Internet Explorer icons. The first one is gonna say lab exam. The second one is gonna say the doc CD. Now, I'm gonna tackle the doc CD first. The doc CD, as far as you're concerned, should be deleted. 
the Doc CD is barely going to work for you. And I know this is not a shot at anybody. All right, I, I want to I, I want to be respectful to to other folks out there that are helping you obtain your CCIE. So I'm going to be respectful here. I don't want this to sound like I'm um, I'm poking at anybody or telling anybody that they're wrong. The Doc CD is a great resource. It really is. It is it is fantastic for you to learn. The Doc CD is a great comfort blanket when you take the exam. In other words, I'm not as nervous as I, as I really could be because I know the Doc CD is there. However, what's going to happen is that once you actually get into your exam and you actually open up the Doc CD and you actually try to use it, you're going to realize that you should not have based your entire lab exam on memorizing where things were in the Doc CD. And I'll tell you why. Because most of the time, it's not even going to work. In other words, you're going to open it and it's not even going to come up or it's not going to work right. I opened a doc CD in, in, in my attempt and all I saw was HTML code. Now, if this was 15 years ago and I could still read HTML, I may have been able to find what I needed in that particular window, but I forgot how to read HTML. I can read iOS commands because I'm a CCIE. So it didn't even work. And when I went to the proctor and said, hey, you know, the doc CD is not really coming up. The, the response was, yeah, but you're a CCIE. They will not help you if the doc CD doesn't work. Sorry, they'll tell you to reboot and work it out and they'll just continue doing what they need to do. All right, so don't depend on the doc CD. If it does actually work and it does actually open, it is gonna be obnoxiously slow. And I mean very slow. Let's just say, for example, you struggle with DMVPN and you've memorized in the doc CD where the DMVPN is because we all know that Cisco's given you that command example that you can just copy and paste and tweak it to what Cisco wants you to use. It's going to take you 10 minutes to get to that. It takes you a lot less time to learn the DMVPN before you go to the lab and then just crank it out and configure it. So don't use the doc CD. But listen, the, the exam, exam day is not the day where you want to learn something new. You do not want to spend $1,600 to, to sit at a workstation, to have to fly halfway across the country to sit and essentially have to web browse into what you're being asked to do. All right, You want to learn it beforehand. Take the extra time to learn how to do a DMVPN, for example, and don't use the doc CD. Please don't use the doc CD. Every single student that I've had has confirmed <clears throat> whether they passed or failed, and I've had a lot of both, okay? Whether they have passed or failed, they have all told me that I was 100% correct in the doc CD. Don't use it, okay? Now, the other Internet Explorer icon is going to be what you're going to use to actually get into your exam. Now, this is not like our CCNA and CCNP where the desktop disappeared and it opened up this exam simulator. It's not like that. So in the, in the version 5 lab exam, when you open up that Internet Explorer icon, which, by the way, is going to be like Internet Explorer version 5, it's going to be pretty old. Um, it'll be, the, the, it'll be the, the lowest version that's still supported in that version of Windows. So Windows XP, it was like version 5 or 6 or something like that. Windows 7, it may be like 8 or 9. I don't know the version, but it's going to be the oldest one. It's not going to be the newest, latest, and greatest. Now, when you open up that lab exam, it's going to ask you for an ID and a password. You're going to enter in the ID and a password that was on that piece of paper. You'll also have two other pieces of paper that are for scrap, so essentially three full pieces of paper together, you will have to deliver those three pieces of paper back to the proctor before you leave. If you do not, the proctor will consider that you trying to take the exam and will most likely bar you. If you're found talking on your cell phone because you didn't listen to me and leave it in your car, the proctor will most likely bar you. It means you're never going to take a CCIE exam again. Just leave it in your car. Leave everything in your car. Return the pieces of paper. Just be very simple, okay? So, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so, so when you open up the exam, you log in with that ID and a password, it's gonna bring you to this welcome page. That welcome page is gonna have a green button on it. That green button is gonna say begin exam. The minute you click begin exam, you are going to be in your troubleshooting section. That is the first section every single RNS candidate has to go through. By default, the time in the, RN, uh, the, the troubleshooting section is two and a half hours, two hours and 30 minutes. Now, a lot of you are saying, wait a second, I thought it was only two hours. Hear me out for a second. The default time, in other words, the timer, there's going to be a great big timer right here in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, and it's going to start counting down from two hours and 30 minutes. It is not going to start counting down at two hours. Okay, it's two hours and 30 minutes. What happens is that once you hit the two-hour mark, you're going to get a pop-up in the middle of your screen that's going to say, hey, by the way, you've reached the two-hour mark in your troubleshooting. Do you want to continue another 30 minutes? Yes or no? 
and you're going to have to select whether you want to continue for the next 30 minutes or whether you want to end your troubleshooting section, okay? If you select yes to continue the, that additional 30 minutes, that 30 minutes actually comes out of your configuration section. So you will get four and a half hours in your config instead of the default, which is five. Okay. If you select no and you say, I don't want to take the extra 30 minutes, essentially, yes, I'm done at two hours. I'm good. I've passed. Or you know what? There's really nothing more I can do. I'm, I'm going to fail. There's really just no other tickets I can solve. I'm going to go ahead and say no. That's a hard option to choose, by the way. So you're going to say no, that 30 minutes does not get used, it stays in your config, which means you get this default five hours in configuration. So, but, but the thing that I want you to remember is that the clock actually doesn't start counting down at two hours. It starts counting down at two and a half hours. Why do I tell you this? Well, because what happens is a lot of folks see this timer, right, and you ignore it, right? So you, you just you start you start cranking away, you start doing your troubleshooting, you're you're cranking through these tickets, and then you hit one that you're struggling on and you're trying to fix it, and now you're actually starting to pay attention on time. Now you're actually saying, Wow, well, I'm gonna run out of time, I'm gonna run out of time. You look up in that upper right hand corner and you see 40 minutes. And you say to yourself, Oh, good. Woo! I'm safe. I got 40 minutes left. There's no big deal. I can absolutely solve this ticket. Wrong. You don't have 40 minutes left. You have 10 minutes left because the clock actually started counting down from two hours and 30 minutes. You have 40 minutes left on that clock. Remember that 30 minutes is your extension. So you actually only have 10 minutes left before you have to go into your 30 minute extension, essentially using all the time in troubleshooting. Now, let's say that you do decide to use the 30 minutes and you essentially fix that last ticket in 10 minutes. We'll make the math easy. So you've used 10 minutes out of the extra 30 and you've hit, you'll, you'll see in the, in the next video, the troubleshooting video, you've hit the button that says end session. I'm just going to say ES because I don't want to write end session. I'm lazy. So you hit end session. That extra 20 minutes or that 20 minutes that you didn't use is going to go back into your configuration section. So now you're going to have four hours and 50 minutes in your configuration. Now the one section that is completely different as far as the times because you can borrow as, as, I'm, as I'm showing you, as I'm telling you this, you can borrow time. So if you finish your TS in an hour, you'd have six hours in config because your, your exam is still going to be the same amount of time, right? The one thing that, the one section of the exam that is different is the diagnostic section. The diagnostic section is a hard 30 minutes. You cannot finish it early. You cannot extend the time. Once you hit start, you are locked into the diagnostic section for a hard 30 minutes. If you finish early, so let's say you get the diagnostic section completed within 15 minutes. For 15 minutes, you're essentially sitting there doing nothing, waiting for the timer to count down. A helpful tip. What a lot of folks did that I've taught in their, in their diagnostic section, and it's something that I recommend, is they used the extra time to build templates. So, you know, they went through and they just created a, uh, they created all their BGP address families. They, they created, you know, a named Modi IGRP template. They created things that they knew were most likely going to be on the exam. And even if they weren't, they just discarded the template, but they created some of these templates that they knew were going to take them a while, like DMVPN, for example. They used that extra time to build those templates beforehand to save the time in the config. And here's the second part to that tip. I would go as far as to say 90% of the things you're going to be asked to configure in the config section, you're also going to be asked to troubleshoot in the troubleshooting section. For example, you're going to be asked to configure Layer 3 VPN in your config section. You're also going to be asked to probably fix a ticket with Layer 3 VPN. You're going to be asked to configure a DMVPN you're also going to be asked to fix a DMVPN. So a lot of the technologies are going to be the same. Now, as I said, this entire lab exam is done in Internet Explorer, right? So you have access to the desktop the entire time, the start menu. In fact, the start menu is going to give you the ability to restart the machine, shut it down. You're going to have access to calculator and notepad. So what I would recommend that you do is when you're in your troubleshooting section and you get to a DMVPN after you fix it, Take that working configuration and put it in the notepad. Save it to the desktop. Yes, they will let you do that. Even if, they, even if they've changed that from when I took my lab and they don't allow you to save it to the desktop, who cares? Pop it in a notepad and leave it open. Don't save it anywhere. Just leave it open because the desktop session itself does not refresh. It doesn't change. You have this workstation throughout the day and it is a full-blown workstation. 
okay? So you can take that running, that working configuration from troubleshooting, you can leave it in Notepad, and then if you have extra time in diagnostics, you can quickly go through it, tweak it, maybe maybe just tweak some of the things that you're gonna wanna change or use in your config section, or maybe that's what you expect you're gonna use or change. That's what that extra time and diet can be used for, okay? So I hope this video was informative. Definitely reach out to me if you guys have any questions. I'll see you in the next video where we're gonna go through the troubleshooting section.